This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on the topic anesthesia pharmacology, covering the keywords that the ABA published in 2020. So this is our keyword review 2021. It's part one of a two-part series, and it's part of the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology's didactic program. If you remember, keywords are published by the American Board of Anesthesia each year. And in 2020, the keywords related to pharmacology are on the next two slides. In our part one, we will cover local anesthetics, neuromuscular blocking agents, opioids, and IV anesthetic agents. And so let's look at those now. Under local anesthetics, epinephrine, the effect on local anesthetic duration. And notice the letter after it, B, refers to the ABA basic content outline and if there's an A after it, it refers to the ABA advanced content outline. We know that epinephrine has very little effect on long-acting local anesthetics like bupivacaine, but can prolong lidocaine, for example. IV regional or beer block and the pharmacology of it, and then local anesthetic systemic toxicity and how do we treat it. Under neuromuscular blocking agents, how is succinylcholine terminated its block by diffusion away from the postjunctional receptor. Acetylcholine hydrolysis, the enzyme involved in it, acetylcholinesterase. Extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors, like which occur after burns. Neostigmine and the side effects, like muscarinic side effects, slowing the heart rate and bronchoconstriction. End-stage renal disease and neuromuscular blockade and how uh, neuromuscular blocking agents like rocuronium and pancuronium can be slightly prolonged while neuromuscular blocking agents like cisatricurium are not. Neuromuscular blocking agents in hyperparathyroidism and how hypercalcemia can uh, cause a resistance to neuromuscular blockade. And then under opioids, opioid tolerance and some of the signs of tolerance like requiring higher doses. Opioids and itching, what's the etiology of that and how do we treat it? Neuraxial opioids and how they work when they're placed in the intrathecal or epidural space. And the conversion of opioids if you're giving them intravenously or intrathecally and want to go back and forth between them, how much do you give to have an equivalent analgesic effect? And then under IV anesthetic agents, ketamine and its psychiatric effects, propofol and its respiratory effects, and dexmedetomidine and its properties. These are the keywords published by the American Board of Anesthesia, which we'll cover in part one. Gaps in knowledge 2020. Gaps in knowledge are topics or questions that were missed frequently by those taking the ABA in training examination, and they're published by the American Board of Anesthesia. Two gaps were related to the topics above. The first was that the duration of action of epidural bupivacaine is not greatly affected by adding epinephrine to it. And another gap was that when you're infusing propofol at relatively low dose, 50 mics per kilo per minute, it has both bronchodilatory as well as respiratory depressant effects. Now in part two, we will cover the inhaled anesthetics pharmacokinetics, and some miscellaneous topics, and we'll go over those at that time. So an overview of the way we will go through the topics, we'll start with local anesthetics, then neuromuscular blocking agents, then opioids, IV induction agents, inhaled anesthetics, pharmacokinetics, and then some miscellaneous topics. Our YouTube educational channel link is below and I would suggest that if you want to go and have a very comprehensive review on some of these topics going back decades of keywords go to the our YouTube channel and look at some of our pharmacology uh, topics so starting in with the keywords from 2020 IV regional pharmacology is our first one this is basically referring to a beer block or extremity block, which is shown in the picture in the top right. You can see that an IV has been established in the extremity. The hand and arm are very white colored because blood has been exsanguinated from it. 
by wrapping it with a rubber bandage from a distal to a proximal direction. And then the tourniquet inflated to 250 millimeters of mercury or about 100 millimeters of mercury above the patient's systolic blood pressure to stop blood flow to that extremity. Then a local anesthetic is injected into that distal hand IV and block sets up very rapidly. It's easy, it has a rapid onset and recovery when you turn off the tourniquet or release the tourniquet and blood returns to the extremity, the block recedes very rapidly. And the block does provide muscle relaxation, so a very controllable duration of anesthesia also. Now the pharmacology was the major keyword related to IV regional. What do we put in that IV? Lidocaine, usually 0.5%. There's no reason to put epinephrine in it. Um, epinephrine vasoconstricts blood vessels, and in this case, the length of action of the local anesthetic is not affected by blood removing it because the tourniquet is up and there is no blood flow to that extremity. There's no reason to put epinephrine in. 25 mils of local anesthetic for a forearm block, up to 50 mils or so for an upper extremity block, so large volume. We don't put bupivacaine through that IV because if bupivacaine happened to leak under the tourniquet or the tourniquet deflated for some reason, you can imagine that large volume, 25 or 50 mils of bupivacaine going uh, systemically and causing local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So that risk of last precludes the use of bupivacaine in IV regional. The mechanism of IV regional is basically the local anesthetic goes through the IV into the vein and nerves surround the vein and probably the local anesthetic diffuses to the wall of the vein and anesthetizes those nerves surrounding it. The duration of the beer block is limited by the tourniquet time and basically when you get more than about two hours of time on a tourniquet we start to worry about ischemia to nerves, ischemia to muscle and so tourniquet time less than two hours is usually what's recommended. The tourniquet can be safely deflated after about 25 minutes or so. For example, if you finished uh, after a 10 minute surgery, let's say something happened very rapidly, you were done, uh, many would leave the tourniquet up for about 25 minutes and then slowly deflate it because if the tourniquet's been up about 25 minutes or more, protein binding of the local anesthetic occurs and there's a very low chance of having deflation induced in systemically absorption of local anesthetic with local anesthetic systemic toxicity. But as that tourniquet goes down, analgesia goes away very quickly and you often will want to start some opioids or infiltrate local or something to uh, cause analgesia if there is going to be a pain associated with whatever was performed. The next keyword is epinephrine and its effect on local anesthetic duration. When local anesthetics are injected, they have an inherent vasodilating effects, with the exception being cocaine, which blocks reuptake of norepinephrine, and the norepinephrine through its alpha effects has vasoconstriction. So if cocaine is put in the nares topically, it's going to vasoconstrict and not only cause analgesia from its local anesthetic effects, but also reduce blood flow from its vasoconstrictive effects. So oftentimes epinephrine is put in with regional blocks in the epidural with the local anesthetic and occasionally uh, in intrathecally with the spinal local anesthetic. Epinephrine commonly in a concentration of 5 mics per mil or 1 to 200,000 with the potential beneficial effects of number one as it vasoconstricts the blood vessels near where it's injected, it's going to decrease the absorption of the local anesthetic and therefore decrease the peak local anesthetic concentration. Number two, it's going to potentially increase the duration and quality of the anesthesia. The uh, blood supply to that area is reduced and the local anesthetic is not taken away as, as rapidly. And if it vasoconstricts in the area where the procedure is being done, blood loss during the procedure could be potentially reduced. Prolongation of the shorter acting local anesthetics like lidocaine uh, 
epinephrine does do that, as opposed to the longer acting local anesthetic like bupivacaine where it doesn't have much effect. So let's look at the graphic, the table on the far right. And first looking at nerve block, you can see that bupivacaine plus or minus effect on nerve block duration. As opposed to lidocaine, it increases the duration. Under epidural, bupivacaine, again, plus or minus effect on the duration. In fact, that was a gap in knowledge on 2020 in training exam, where uh, some believed that epinephrine would prolong a bupivacaine epidural block, and it doesn't have much effect. As opposed to lidocaine, or if you add epinephrine, it does prolong the duration of effect of the local anesthetic in the uh, epidural space. And under spinal bupivacaine, not much effect. And again, under lidocaine, some effect. So therefore, the point that epinephrine can prolong the shorter acting local anesthetics like lidocaine, as opposed to the longer acting local anesthetics like bupivacaine. The next topic is local anesthetic systemic toxicity and the treatment of such. The American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine's checklist for treatment of LAST is shown at the far right. When a large dose of local anesthetic becomes systemic, either through a uh, injection intravascularly or a tourniquet going down after a beer block, for example, you can have initially central nervous system symptoms like seizures. And if a seizure occurs, benzodiazepines like midazolam can be given. Uh, uh, if patients have a hypotension and cardiovascular instability, although propofol can stop the seizure, probably not wise to give if they're already hypotensive. So benzodiazepines are often preferred to stop the seizure. Airway management, ventilate the patient with 100% oxygen and hyperventilate them. The cardiovascular system can be affected also the sodium channels which are blocked by local anesthetics there are sodium channels in the cardiovascular system that also can be blocked and it's the R isomers of the local anesthetic that tend to be more toxic for example ropivacaine is the S enantiomer and so it's less cardiotoxic but if those local anesthetics get into those sodium channels you can see how they could cause an AV block slowing of the heart rate, decreased conduction through the heart, the heart doesn't contract as well, blood vessels vasodilate, and you have a hypotensive, uh, low cardiac output state associated with LAST. Bupivacaine is especially bad for local anesthetic systemic toxicity because it's a slow in, slow out from the sodium channels. And if toxicity occurs, airway management is appropriate initially, hyperventilate the patient, and get very rapidly to administration of a lipid emulsion. And the lipid emulsion is a 20% lipid solution, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, or approximately 100 mils as a bolus. This is not the propofol lipid solution, or not propofol is not to be substituted for this lipid solution or lipid emulsion, even though they look similar. So once you give that 100 mil bolus, if the patient is still not recovering, um, you can repeat the bolus if persistent cardiovascular collapse and you can start an infusion at 0.25 mils per kilogram per minute. And if further resuscitative measures are required, low dose epinephrine, we don't give the higher doses often associated with ACLS, doses like less than one mic per kilogram and we avoid vasopressin Vasopressin is not part of ACLS protocols now, so that's easier to remember. If the patient is in V-fib, we're going to be doing CPR. We're not going to give them lidocaine to treat V-fib, but amiodarone. And we're going to avoid things that could cause even more hypotension and reduced cardiac contractility like calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. And cardiopulmonary bypass may be necessary and uh, especially for bupivacaine-induced local anesthetic systemic toxicity. So lipid emulsion is the treatment, a bolus of 100 mils approximately, and repeating it if necessary and starting an infusion uh, to treat local anesthetic systemic toxicity. The next topic is succinylcholine and the termination of blockade. So the key word is based upon, well, how is succinylcholine's blockade terminated? 
In the picture at the right, let's look at that first. When succinylcholine is administered intravenously and circulates in the plasma, heading for the muscle, some of it is actually metabolized before it gets anywhere. Pseudocholinesterase, an enzyme made in the liver, is present in the plasma. And pseudocholinesterase breaks down succinylcholine very rapidly to choline and succinic acid. So before succinylcholine even gets to the neuromuscular junction, it is being broken down. It then diffuses through the blood vessel wall, gets out and into the skeletal muscle where it binds alpha subunits, the two alpha subunits of a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. And this is the same site that are non-depolarizers like rock uranium and also acetylcholine work at. Once succinylcholine binds there, the uh, succinylcholine has to diffuse away from the motor end plate back into the extracellular fluid uh, where pseudocholinesterase is present uh, and its termination is diffusion away from the motor end plate. It then is metabolized, hydrolyzed by pseudocholinesterase, the enzyme that's in the plasma and older names for it are like butyrocholinesterase, same enzyme, pseudocholinesterase, plasma cholinesterase where it's located and butyrocholinesterase are the same name for the same enzyme, or a different name for the same enzyme. Now the location of pseudocholinesterase being in the plasma, it's not at the post-junctional membrane like acetylcholinesterase is. And it is synthesized in the liver, and if the liver is not working well, we can have a decreased quantity of pseudocholinesterase, which can result in a decreased breakdown of succinylcholine, uh, and we can have problems sometimes with genetic variants of the uh, enzyme that breaks down succinylcholine pseudocholinesterase. Dibucane is an amide local anesthetic that normally inhibits pseudocholinesterase uh, 80%. In patients that are heterozygous, it will inhibit it somewhere between about 40 to 60%. If there's homozygous variants, it inhibits uh, pseudocholinesterase only about 20 percent. If a patient has heterozygous variant genetically and you give them succinylcholine, it may prolong uh, the action up to 10 or 20 minutes or so in length. Oftentimes we would not even know uh, because we're not checking during that time period. A homozygous, however, variant, 20 percent inhibited only by dibucane, may last hours if succinylcholine is given to the patient and in that case, uh, sedation with prolonged ventilation, sometimes uh, uh, administration of pseudocholinesterase either through fresh frozen plasma or some other um, uh, administration can be done to treat uh, this prolonged effect. In the case of the heterozygous patient, usually just simple observation uh, during that short period of time, 10 to 20 minutes of prolongation is the treatment. The next topic is, is acetylcholine hydrolysis and the enzyme involved in it, acetylcholinesterase. And let's look at the picture at the right first where we have a nerve impulse coming down a nerve. The vesicles containing acetylcholine coalesce in the presynaptic nerve terminal as calcium comes in. Acetylcholine is released into the synaptic cleft represented in purple color here and bind to the nicotinic cholinergic receptor represented by orange on the postsynaptic nerve terminal. And you can see in green the acetylcholinesterase enzyme location which is present in the neuromuscular cleft postsynaptically right near those nicotinic cholinergic receptors ready to hydrolyze acetylcholine into acetate and choline. That acetylcholinesterase enzyme is what we inhibit with neostigmine in an attempt to raise acetylcholine levels to reverse neuromuscular blockade. Neostigmine is an anticholinesterase. Pritostigmine is another type of anticholinesterase occasionally taken by patients with myasthenia gravis. It also inhibits acetylcholinesterase, as does physostigmine, but we use physostigmine because it crosses the blood-brain barrier unlike pritostigmine or neostigmine and can be used to treat central anticholinergic syndrome induced by, for example, scopolamine or atropine use in some patients.
Now, organophosphates, insecticides, um, block block the acetylcholinesterase enzyme and raise acetylcholine levels, and we treat organophosphate poisoning with atropine. Nerve gases like serin nerve gas also block anticholinesterases and can be treated with atropine. Donepazil or Aricept is used in the treatment of patients with Alzheimer's. It actually crosses the blood-brain barrier and it can block Anticol- block acetylcholinesterase and raise acetylcholine levels in the central nervous system. Now, if it is uh, inhibiting acetylcholinesterase, both centrally and also peripherally, you can see how it could cause uh, a resistance to neuromuscular blockade, non depolarizers, and actually, because it can block pseudocholinesterase, it can also prolong succinylcholine. So, donepazil or Aricep treatment for patients with Alzheimer's can have an effect on our neuromuscular blocker use. Extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors are proliferation of neuromuscular junction receptors outside of that normal area, post-junctional, to on the muscle membranes all over the muscle. And it occurs after denervation injury, lower motor nerve injuries, upper motor nerve injuries, muscle diseases, prolonged bed rest, prolonged neuromuscular blocker administration, and the classic being the burns. Now those extra junctional receptors are not present just on the other side of the uh, junction. They're all over the place. And if you administer, for example, succinylcholine to a patient with extra junctional receptors, they stay open longer and potassium is released and you get hyperkalemic arrest potentially where you would need to treat starting with your airway breathing and circulation but the treatment of hyperkalemia would be calcium administration alkalinization hyperventilation insulin and glucose to drive the potassium into the cell and inhaled beta agonists um, that also drive potassium into the cell these extrajunctional acetylcholine receptors are responsive to both acetylcholine and succinylcholine. They have relatively short half-lives and one protein subunit difference. So the picture on the right shows at the top a mature innervated uh, acetylcholine receptor and you can see that the two alpha subunits are the important ones for which our uh, neuromuscular blockers bind as well as acetylcholine bind as well as succinylcholine bind to. Immature denervated, these extra junction receptors are different by that one protein subunit and they stay open longer and can release potassium and cause the hyperkalemic arrest when we give succinylcholine to someone with these extra junctional receptors. So sucks induced hyperkalemia can be caused by upregulation of receptors like these with burn patients and they can cause breakdown of muscle or rhabdomyolysis in patients with myopathies muscular dystrophy, and if you are administer sucks to those patients and muscles breaking down, you can imagine how much potassium is released from those muscles and how difficult it would be to resuscitate a patient with continued potassium efflux. The next topic is neostigmine side effects. And if you look at the pictures at the top right, you can see acetylcholine coming down and it can bind to nicotinic receptors, that's for muscle, skeletal muscle movement, and it can bind to muscarinic receptors, and those receptors are different. Curare can uh, block the nicotinic receptor, rocuronium blocks the nicotinic receptor, the muscarinic receptor is blocked by atropine. If you look at the bottom right picture, you can see the parasympathetic nervous system, the postganglionic fibers release acetylcholine onto muscarinic receptors as opposed to the somatic nervous system in the red star that releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors or skeletal muscle. And when we give neostigmine to a patient, it inhibits the cholinesterase enzyme, acetylcholinesterase, and raises acetylcholine levels. And we do that to try to get skeletal muscle strength back. While there are muscarinic side effects that can occur that we normally block with the administration of the anticholinergic glycopyrrolate, those muscarinic side effects occur in, include things like bradycardia, 
um, slowing of AV conduction, hypersalivation, and bronchial constriction. And so someone who has organophosphate poisoning and the classic sludge symptoms from having too much acetylcholine around because the uh, acetylcholinesterase enzyme is blocked, they salivate and they lacrimate and they urinate and defecate and they have GI upset and they vomit and the treatment is atropine to block the acetylcholine. Now, some miscellaneous points related to this keyword. One is can you get recurrization in patients with renal failure after you administer them neostigmine as part of the reversal of neuromuscular blockade? Neostigmine's action is prolonged by renal failure similar to the neuromuscular blocking agent like rocuronium. So we tend not to get recurrization. We don't worry so much about is this patient who has renal failure, who have given rocuronium, for example, during a case, and I reverse them with neostigmine. The neostigmine effect is going to pro be prolonged by the renal failure, and we don't worry uh, much about recurrization in the recovery room. Neostigmine doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. Physostigmine does, and that's what we use in patients who, for example, have been given scopolamine or atropine, an elderly patient who receives those can get very delirious and physostigmine can uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and treat this delirium and it is the treatment for central anticholinergic syndrome. Physostigmine, not neostigmine. Neostigmine also inhibits pseudocholinesterase so its effect not only on the acetylcholinesterase but the plasma cholinesterase uh, or pseudocholinesterase and can potentiate succinylcholine in its effect. So succinylcholine administration immediately after neostigmine reversal, for example, if you reverse someone with neostigmine and then they, they uh, had laryngospasm after you extubated them and you had to administer succinylcholine, the neostigmine can prolong that succinylcholine effect much more than the classic five minutes or so duration effect of succinylcholine. The next keyword topic is end-stage renal disease and neuromuscular blockade. Pancuronium starts with a P. It's excreted mainly in the P and it's prolonged very much. Vecuronium and rocuronium, intermediate prolongation a little bit. Cisatricurium has spontaneous degradation and Hoffman elimination and we don't worry much about it during end-stage renal disease uh, patients. Uh, uh, when we give it for neuromuscular blockade because it just breaks down spontaneously as does atricurium's pharmacology not much affected. Mivacurium and succinylcholine are broken down by plasma cholinesterase and they are also unaffected by end-stage renal disease and succinylcholine is not contraindicated in patients with uh, renal failure assuming that their potassium is not high. Now, reversal of uh, neuromuscular blockade, neostigmine's action, as we mentioned in the previous slide, is prolonged by uh, renal failure and recurrization is unlikely in the recovery room. Sugamidex is not approved for patients with end-stage renal disease, and we often will use a neostigmine in those cases. The next key word is neuromuscular blockade and hyperparathyroidism. Hyperparathyroidism is associated with hypercalcemia. And if we look at the picture on the far right where a nerve action potential is coming down the nerve, calcium is coming uh, outside to inside that presynaptic membrane and calcium entry results in acetylcholine release, you can see why if you have lots of calcium around, how you could have lots of acetylcholine release and you could have resistance to neuromuscular blockade. And that is the classic answer to the effect of hyperparathyroidism on neuromuscular blockade. There's resistance. Same like dilantin administration, integritol, and other anticonvulsants can cause resistance to neuromuscular blocking agents. Just as a review, what things can potentiate neuromuscular blocking uh, agents? Inhaled anesthetics do it much more than does TIVA and nitrous oxide. Inhaled anesthetics potentiate both our non-depolarizers and succinylcholine. Magnesium. Magnesium, occasionally administered in OB anesthesia, can potentiate both our non-depolarizers like rocuronium and our depolarizers like succinylcholine by decreasing 
presynaptic release of acetylcholine. So where that calcium comes in, magnesium uh, does just the opposite and there's less presynaptic release of acetylcholine. Some antibiotics have a prejunctional effect. Aminoglycosides like gentamicin, tetracycline, clindamycin, bacitracin, but not our classic surgical prophylactic antibiotics like the cephalosporins. Calcium channel blockers, you can see why uh, if calcium's involved in neuromuscular transmission, if, uh, if you block the calcium movement intracellularly presynaptically, how this could potentiate neuromuscular blockers. Just the opposite of what hyperparathyroidism did. Local anesthetics can potentiate. Lithium, used for mania treatment, potentiates both our non-depolarizers and our depolarizers and also decreases MAC, Lasix, dantrolene, being cold, hypocalcemic, all can potentiate neuromuscular blockade. And interestingly, if you use two different classes of neuromuscular blockers, one after the other, for example, for example, if you were given rocuronium, a steroidal neuromuscular blocking agent, and then gave cisatricurium a benzoisoquinoline, different chemical structure, there is synergism, as opposed to if I gave rocuronium a steroidal, and then vecuronium after that, a steroidal, there tends to be just an additive effect. The next topic is opioid tolerance and the signs of it. Tolerance by definition is where you adapt uh, to a drug's effect over time. There's less effect uh, as you are exposed to that drug over time. With regards to opioid tolerance and hyperalgesia, when you're exposed to opioids for long periods of time, prolonged exposure, it activates the NMDA receptors. And this seems to be important in the development of opioid tolerance and also hyperalgesia or increased pain sensitivity. And you'll see many anesthesiologists now infusing low doses of ketamine to block the NMDA receptor to reduce uh, the amount of opioids needed and potentially reduce this hyperalgesia that can occur. Tolerance to opioids, constipation and pupillary constriction are side effects of opioids that are one of the least likely to develop, develop tolerance to. So people are using opioids for a long time, remain constipated from taking opioids and also have their pupils pretty small even though they're getting used to taking opioids. Signs of increased uh, uh, opioid tolerance, if you're using more and more of the opioid, more milligrams needed of morphine, for example, to have a blunting of the autonomic responses like tachycardia and hypertension to pain, this would be a sign of opioid tolerance. Opioids and itching or puritis. The incidence epidural and intrathecally seems to be more than intravenously, somewhere around 20 to 100% epidurally or intrathecally, 10 to 50% uh, intravenous opioids. So itching pretty common with opioids, and as you go up on the dose, more itching occurs. Why does it occur? Not really totally sure. Intravenous morphine, codeine, and meperidine all can release histamine, which is a non-immunologic release from mast cells and may be part of the cause of pruritus from intravenous administration of opioids. But when we give opioids neuraxially, epidurally or intrathecally, the opioid mu, mu receptor seems to be central to this pruritus. Uh, and we treat opioid-induced pruritus when it's severe, uh, epidurally or intrathecally caused with low-dose naloxone. So neuraxial is not histamine release causing the pruritus, but seems to be mediated by the mu receptor. And if we look at the graphic on the far right with opioid-induced pruritus in the middle, and in the top right, the highest efficacy treatment tends to be naloxone. Low doses, either as a bolus followed by an infusion, or sometimes just a small bolus can stop the itching. In possible efficacy on the uh, far left of that graphic, things like low-dose propofol and ondansetron. And then if it is histamine released, and this would be not intrathecal or epidural opioid pruritus uh, causation, but maybe intravenous morphine administered uh, pruritus, 
diphenhydramine or Benadryl in antihistamine can be used to decrease the itching. The next topic is neuraxial opioids and their mechanism of action. Opioids act in several different places anatomically. The substantia gelatinosa in the spinal cord and in the bottom right graphic in the red circle you can see where the substantia gelatinosa is located and as uh, pain signals come in and are processed. Opioids are working at that site. They're also working up in the periaqueductal gray area up in the brainstem. And the mu1 receptor is especially important for analgesia, both supraspinal and spinal. It's the mu2 that's associated with respiratory depression, bradycardia, and there's some other subtypes like mu delta kappa. These neuraxial opioids act by inhibiting ascending transmission of pain information from the spinal cord dorsal horn and they also activate pain control circuits that descend from the midbrain and modulate pains. Opioids mechanism of action, how do they act at the neuronal level? They bind to the mu receptor and inhibit release of different neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, and substance P. And if we look at the graphic on the right, you can see an afferent C fiber, a pain conducting fiber, with morphine in orange, morphine binding to the green little mu receptor, G protein mediated effect, and it inhibits adenocyclase, reducing cyclic AMP and reducing calcium influx in that presynaptic area, and therefore inhibits the release of neurotransmitters. And postsynaptically, it has effect also. There's the mu receptor, morphine binding to it, G protein mediated, and it increases calcium or potassium efflux postsynaptically, which makes it more negative inside that nerve or hyperpolarizes it so it doesn't conduct. So via the mu receptor, via its effect on neurotransmitters and on calcium and potassium, opioids have their effect. If we're going to convert opioids from intravenous to intrathecal or intrathecal to intravenous, this was the next key word. Intrathecal opioid analgesia has its effect directly at the substantia gelatinosa, that's the spinal effect, and it also has a supraspinal effect secondary to absorption. So if you give an opioid intrathecally or epidurally, some of it has its effect right at the, um, at the spinal level but some of it's absorbed uh, and has a supraspinal effect. Intrathecal hydrophobic opioids or water-soluble opioids like morphine work primarily through just staying and having a direct spinal effect. They're not lipid-soluble and they're not absorbed much. And the concentration intrathecally, because they're hydrophobic, stays pretty high and stays high for longer. And it could stay in the cerebral spinal fluid and move rostrally up towards the head and there's this risk of delayed respiratory depression associated with morphine when it's administered intrathecally. Intrathecal hydrophilic opioids like sufentanil and fentanyl work primarily through supraspinal effect. That is, they're absorbed quickly into the plasma because they're so lipid soluble and can, can cross uh, plasma membranes. And they increase the plasma concentration over the intrathecal concentration, and they have a higher risk of early respiratory depression. Now if we're going to convert morphine, morphine 10 milligrams IV is equivalent approximately to 1 milligram epidurally and about 0.1 milligram intrathecally. So morphine is about 1 one hundredth. Uh, IV is what you would put in the uh, intrathecal space and about 1 tenth of the epidural dose in the intrathecal space. And I've shown fentanyl uh, con conversion rates of approximately 100 mics intravenously being equivalent to about a third of that epidurally and about 6 to 10 mics intrathecally. The next key word is ketamine psychiatric effects. We know that ketamine works at the NMDA receptor. It's a glutaminergic antagonist or NMDA receptor antagonist. Emergence delirium is associated with ketamine. Patients wake up feeling very weird, hearing and seeing things. And this is increased if you've also given them atropine to reduce their salivation because atropine crosses the blood-brain barrier. And emergence delirium is decreased with benzodiazepine administration like midazolam. 
Ketamine causes dissociative anesthesia by dissociating the thalamus from cortical projections and patients end up in a trance-like cataleptic state where they have pain relief, they're asleep, and they don't remember anything. Ketamine also has antidepressant effects and if you've been reading the literature much you probably realize that uh, there are ketamine infusion centers being set up for the treatment of major depression. They have a very fast effect within one hour of IV administration but don't last very long this antidepressant effect um, um, and it's likely not NMDA mediated and incompletely understood its antidepressant effect. And ketamine infusions are being used during surgery in an attempt to reduce the amount of opioids administered and to prevent opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Propofol respiratory effects is the next keyword. What does propofol do to the respiratory system? Well, you know when you give an induction dose of propofol, frequently patients become apneic. When you give infusions, like 100 mics per kilo per minute, the tidal volume tends to go down of a patient and their respiratory rate tends to go up. The propofol depresses the ventilatory response to hypoxia similar to the volatile anesthetic such that if you become hypoxic you will not hyperventilate as much if propofol is on board. Propofol is also a bronchodilator. Remember volatile anesthetics are bronchodilators. Well propofol is also and its mechanism is probably inhibition of calcium mobilization. And propofol potentiates HPV or hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as opposed to the volatile anesthetics which actually impaired hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. If you're having problems with one lung ventilation and oxygenating a patient well under volatile anesthetic, occasionally TIVA anesthetic might help that. A gap in knowledge in 2020 was that an infusion of propofol at 50 mics per kilo per minute, what would you see from a respiratory effect? You'd see bronchodilation as well as some respiratory depressant effects. Our last key word in part one is dexmedetomidine and its properties. Clonidine and dexmedetomidine are selective alpha-2 agonists and dexmedetomidine is even more selective than is clonidine. Because it's an alpha-2 agonist, it presynaptically inhibits norepinephrine release, and this is both centrally as well as peripherally, and the patient gets sleepy from less norepinephrine centrally. It decreases MAC, has an analgesic sparing effect or morphine sparing effect. Patients tend to breathe right through uh, dexmedetomidine or presidex sedation, like in the ICU. And Interestingly, it has some anti-shivering effects that could be uh, taken advantage of in the recovery room if you have a patient who's shivering. And it decreases sympathetic activity output by blocking norepinephrine release. So if it's decreasing norepinephrine release peripherally, you can imagine how blood pressure could go down and potentially heart rate could go down. And we have to be careful in patients who are already in heart block or have severe LV dysfunction, giving them dexmedetomidine. It can uh, decrease blood pressure and indirectly decrease cardiac output. Interestingly, uh, if you give dexmedetomidine as a rapid bolus over a very short period of time, you can get a transient and paradoxical hypertension or elevation in blood pressure rather than hypotension. And that is the reason why it's recommended that dexmedetomidine given, be given over approximately 10 minutes if you're using a bolus. And this paradoxical effect may be due to initial stimulation of alpha-2 receptors in vascular smooth muscle with a vasoconstricting effect. We avoid that by just giving the bolus over a longer period of time. And if you stop giving a dexmedetomidine effusion after it's been going for some time, we tend not to see rebound effects like we do with clonidine. If you stop clonidine preoperatively or take a patch off of someone of clonidine, you can get rebound hypertensive effects. This is the last key word in part one of two-part series. Um, I hope you have a great day. This is a picture of the French Alps where I uh, fortunately had a chance to bicycle in September of 2019, Chamonix, France. Have a great day.